All right, uh, so in our final week, we're going to be taking a look at Bloodborne. Those of you familiar with the Dark Souls series should recognize this. Uh, I'm just going to start a new game real quick, and we're going to watch the opening cinematic. Oh, yeah. Pale blood. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. You need only unravel its mystery. But where's an outsider like yourself to begin? Easy, with a bit of yarn and blood of your own. But first, you'll need a contract. So cool. Uh, we're jumping right into character creation. And of course, what is a Lovecraft uh, class without making a Lovecraft avatar? Um, so forgive me as I bumble through this. I just want to mention a few things um, about the setup uh, in that, that cinematic. The last time we looked at Bloodborne, we were talking about Lovecraft's racial past, and namely his, folk, his endorsement of eugenics and his status as a... a, a a racist um, and and many of you were were apt to say that uh, yeah everybody was a little racist back then uh, but he was a specific breed like no he was a specific level of racism that was that was really really troubling um, so I want to focus in on this opening cinematic and how uh, the emphasis of blood this idea of blood ministration, of internalizing blood, the only way that we can, uh, as pale bloods, uh, to move forward in the game is to have a little bit of yarn on blood of our own. So I, I, I want to raise the question that is this a echoing of Lovecraft's racism, or is this a reinterpretation of it? Is the game being uh, overtly aware of Lovecraft's uh, racism and in some way reorganizing it that that we have to focus in on on blood it's foregrounding this this narrative device so for me it sounds like bloodborne's insistence on on blood works counter to lovecraft's sort of uh, racism that that it keys into us it makes the hairs on the back of our neck stand up um but as we see throughout the game um there is an emphasis on using blood to heal, on uh, collecting blood echoes from defeated monsters. So the, this idea of internalizing and foregrounding a discussion on blood may actually be the game's overt uh, way of responding to Lovecraft's racism. Who knows?
Good. All signed and sealed. Now, let's begin the transfusion. Oh, don't you worry. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad. Okay, I just want to interject real quick uh, as we watch these little minions crawl on us um, to help us out. Is that last beast that we saw, that skinless werewolf, uh, coming out of a pool of blood, almost beckoning to us? It wasn't, it wasn't threatening, it was beckoning. Um, and it then erupts into fire. So we're already dealing with a narrative emphasis ah, on... You found yourself a hunter on becoming a a beast, right? Or dealing with the internalization of a beast and that that's purged away by fire. Uh, so this, uh, in game terms, also gives you a weakness of, of major animals and beasts that you're going to be fighting, i.e. fire. And you'll see that coming up in this playthrough. So right now, uh, we're just walking around. You can immediately get a sense of the environment, how dark this game is, and how little narrative explanation we have. Um, we are, uh, as the, that weird sort of ethereal voice said, a hunter. Um, we don't know exactly of what, of how to hunt, um, and we kind of just have to proceed forward. So this is a cool mechanic uh, throughout the game online, um, which I am not online now. There, You can leave notes to other players. Um, these notes serve as warnings, as guides, as kind of inside jokes. Um, okay, I have no weapons, so I'm going to go into a battle of fisticuffs with what looks like a giant werewolf. game is kind of avert. You are dead. Uh, the cool thing here, though, is the game does not reward success in this battle. You have to die to proceed in the narrative. You have to fail. Uh, so the focus in on player failing um, just to proceed forward to get this awesome cinematic is then uh, underscoring the, the idea to the player that you're going to die quite a bit. Um, and then sometimes the way forward is actually what you perceive to be a few steps backward. Um, so we have entered what's called the Hunter's Dream, this 
weird sort of ethereal plane um, that because of the Yarnum blood uh, we have access to. And here of course is where we're going to to pick up our weapons. Um, notice the the architecture. Uh, again this is sort of like Victorian Gothic which as we all know uh, comes way before Lovecraft. Um, but still has this element of strangeness that I want to kind of encounter. So we have these little little beings helping us out. The messengers offer you a trick weapon. On my first playthrough, I decided to be a bourgeois pig and uh, use the cane, because ooh, why not? However, uh, I think Lovecraft might actually pick the Hunter's Axe. Uh, it's blunt, it's uh, kind of forward, uh, and uh, it makes a lot of blood. Okay, we're back in the real world, and, uh, well, real in quotes, and we're given a few more tips uh, by these lovely little messengers uh, how to handle our weapons. So uh, the game's giving us a little bit of structure, but we're being placed right back into where we left off. We have to beat that troublesome werewolf that we have downstairs. making short work of an enemy that gave us pause before. So, blood vials. Uh, you saw me use one just right back there. It, that is the method to regain health. Um, in the game, you have to ingest or use, consume in some way, uh, the blood uh, that you pick up. And again, no narrative direction. Uh, remember our last playthrough of Resident Evil 7 where we had a clear objective and where to go. Um, here we're kind of just opening doors and seeing what happens. But yet there's a progression, there is a linearity. There are paths that are locked, like this gate here. Um, there are only a few places we can go. Uh, the beast-like people of Yarnum. This should automatically send you thinking about the shadow over Innsmouth. Um, instead of uh, the Innsmouth look with fish-like features, we're given these beastly, degenerated townsfolk um, that we have to mercilessly just tear into. Um, so again, this is a Lovecraftian trope. It's not unique to Lovecraft, but for our intent and purposes, I, I, um, we are, we're, we're safe to label it as such. But again, you have no idea why you're killing these people, how they came to be, or why they're here. Uh, you are merely just hacking and slashing. And 
and any sane person would probably nope out of there after hearing that. Uh, but this game forces you to keep going. I'll talk about the lamps in a second. I want you to hear... You must be a hunter. And not one from around here either. I'm Gilbert, a fellow outsider. You must have had a fine time of it. Yarnum has a special way of treating guests. Well, I don't think I could stand if I wanted to, but I'm willing to help if there's anything that can be done. <laughs> this town is cursed. Whatever your reasons might be, you should plan a swift exit. Whatever can be gained from this place, it will do more harm than good. Pale blood, you say? Hmm. Never heard of it. But if it's blood you're interested in, you should try the Healing Church. The Church controls all knowledge on blood ministration and all varieties of blood. Across the valley to the east of Yarnum lies the town of the Healing Church, known as the Cathedral Ward. And deep within Cathedral Ward is the old Grand Cathedral, the birthplace of the Healing Church's special blood, or so they say. <laughs> Yarnamites don't share much with outsiders. Normally, they wouldn't let you near the place, but the hunt is on tonight. This might be your chance. Across the valley to the east of you, deep within lies the old main cathedral said to be the source of blood. I haven't heard of pale blood, but that's your best bet if it's anything to do with unique types of blood. <laughs> okay, so we got our first bit of narrative uh, from a source that a non-discerning player might just bypass. Um, so this is a really awesome carryover from the Dark Souls games. Um, that you have to seek out a narrative, you have to read descriptions, you have to talk to NPCs, and you have to keep talking to them. Um, every time we interacted with Gilbert there, we had to reinitialize uh, speech, and you have to do that until the speech cycle is complete and you have a vague idea of where we're going. Um, so we have to proceed through Yarnum here, hacking and slashing our way through the Yarnumites, uh, to get to Cathedral Ward to find out, hopefully, possibly, more about um, pale bloods and this weird thing called blood ministration. So here I'm testing that theory that we learned from the opening cinematic. Notice how quickly the enemies fall? So again, you're rewarded for piecing together slight details of, of plot. So as we saw with Gilbert's door, those little red shiny lanterns uh, usually mean that an NPC is nearby and we can talk to them. Um, maybe we'll get more plot. Are you that outsider? Well, sorry, but I don't want anything to do with you. Trot along, will ya? Guess not. So again, the game subverts our thinking. Um, Usually, the Red Lanterns mean NPCs that we can interact with, maybe get some plot, but now we know that's not always true. Lads, you've come up. You'd open the door on a night of a hunt. Away with you. Now!
my favorite parts. Now, I spoiled the trap here, but this game, it, you see the glowing item that you're supposed to interact with, and if you just interact with that item, um, the game will punish you. So again, this is like a tutorial level. It's setting up mechanics for the rest of the play. Well, you saw it earlier in the first battle of the werewolf, um, but you can regain health if you get hit and immediately strike back. Um, this rewards violence um, and rewards just hacking and slashing to recover on your mistakes. Notice the uh, the decor. I focused in earlier on the beastie on a crucifix. Uh, the same thing's happening here. A bunch of townspeople are gathering around something that is being burned. Um, so this is this is already uh, signifying some significance, uh, some ritual significance or importance to um, the hunt and what happens to those who perhaps go too far in their transformation. Again, giant door seems to be burgeoning. Oh, nope, it's locked. If you listen to what these townspeople are saying, we've heard a few um, cycles of typical dialogue. Um, it's all your fault. Uh, get out of here, you vagrant rat. Um, this town is cursed. You are cursed. Um, so again, we're getting little narrative pieces as we make our way through, but you really have to pay attention. You have to explore and listen as you kind of enter this unknown place. Again, just taking the environment. I know this is a playthrough and I'm kind of speeding through the tutorial um, on my way to the first boss, but I think it's worth mentioning the sort of aesthetic feeling that we're getting and what the game's privileging and wants her, wants her eyes to focus on. So how would you classify uh, this landscape? Uh, think back into when we were playing, or two, when we were playing Resident Evil 7. Reckon you're from round here. Well, stuck outside on a night of the hunt. Oh, you poor, poor thing. <laughs>
again, a strange sound. We don't quite know what it is. Uh, the game's not given us much. And the, the focus here on darkness, I think, is um, in player visibility. You don't get a, a way to subvert this darkness for a little while. Um, so you're constantly walking around um, in limited visibility. And how does that amplify our sense of horror, of terror, and, uh, and I apologize here, I'm cheesing these two werewolves. So the lesson we take away from this is werewolves uh, can't go through doors. Uh, but your axe can. And here we get one little plot bit, and these are peppered throughout. It's easily missed by uh, a player if they don't know what they're looking for. And yet, it adds to the narrative. So the game's telling us that we have to pay attention. And the only way we're going to get a full understanding of these events is to collect documents. Um, or to pay really close attention to the narrative threads that are presented. And we're back where we started with Gilbert. Um, so you can see how circular and maze-like this level is, but how also linear. Um, and how do you think, we talked a lot about linearity in uh, Resident Evil 7 and that, that movement forward. How does this game disguise that? Um, a good game will try to hide that sort of railroading, this you must go here, you must go there. Um, I think that uh, Bloodborne does a neat way of hiding that sort of railroading through. Do you catch it? Aha! You must be the new hunter. Welcome to the hunter's dream. This will be your home for now. I am... Gehrman, friend to you hunters. You're sure to be in a fine haze about now, but don't think too hard about all of this. Just go out and kill a few beasts. It's for your own good. You know, it's just what hunters do. You'll get used to it. This was once a safe haven for hunters. A workshop where hunters used blood to enhance their weapons and flesh. We don't have as many tools as we once did, but you're welcome to use whatever you find. Even the doll, should it please you. This was once a you even. So, 
uh, creepy old man, uh, guardian of the hunter's dream, kind of stumbles when he gives us a name. Does that remind you of a narrative device? And notice his advice. Ah, don't think too hard about all of this. Don't analyze what you're doing. Just go out and kill some beasts. It will be good for you. Um, so we have two competing narratives here. Us trying to figure things out and understand why we are hunting. Um, what is the hunt and why we're here and how we get out. And then another one that just says, ah, don't think about it. Just commit grievous bodily harm. It's good for you. So this is also uh, important to recognize. Every time that you import from the Hunter's Dream all of the beasties that you have slaughtered or the townsfolk that you have cut your way through uh, reappear. And for those of you who are like, he cut down that innocent man in a wheelchair, uh, you're about to see why I did that. The innocent man has a gun. Nothing is what it seems. Now I'm cutting out most of uh, the tutorial level here, uh, or Central Yarnum, um, to really expedite uh, this video, because you can easily spend three hours or more hunting around, taking in the aesthetics, but I really just want to give you a feeling of the game aesthetically and how narrative progresses. Um, so I'm kind of going to speed through this bridge here and go to our first optional boss. Now, right there those terms should should pique your interest. Optional boss. Um, so here is something in a game that uh, if you explore you can have, have at and hack and slash or uh, you can just move on without exploring and miss something that is kind of narratively neat. And notice again how you're just thrusted into this. Uh, no sense of what this clerical beast is or cleric beast is. Um, no sense of why you have to hack and slash it, but notice uh, its design. And again, I want you to pay particular attention to some of the design of these monsters. We've seen werewolves, we've seen beasties, uh, so this is also responding to a horror tradition just outside of Lovecraft. We get, as you saw in the, the narrative video, we get a lot of uh, tentacle beasts later on. But here we're focusing in on like traditional horror themes. Uh, werewolves, um, degenerated townsfolk. So this is responding more, uh, more to than just love.
of course I had to give you a finisher on it. Just to prove that your instructor is not a noob at the game. I don't know if you noticed, but after beating that monster, our insight, so that top right hand corner of the screen shows how many blood echoes we have, and then the little eye is insight. This is a fascinating mechanic in the game. As you experience the terror of the world of Yarnum and you keep uncovering these beasties of various Lovecraftian inheritance, your insight grows and you're able to see things. So notice how the doll before, when we had zero insight, was. Uh, not functioning. The doll now is awake, more human-like, um, and we can see more of the world. Uh, later on this happens where monsters physically alter depending on the level of insight. The game gets more difficult as you collect more insight. Here in this dream to look after you. Honorable hunter, pursue the echoes of blood and I will channel them into your strength. You will hunt beasts, and I will be here for you to embolden your sickly spirit. Did so, you speak with German? He was a hunter long, long ago, but now serves only to advise them. He is obscure, unseen in the dreaming world. Still, he stays here, in this dream. Such is his purpose. Ah, the little ones, inhabitants of the dream. They find hunters like yourself, worship and serve them. Speak words they do not. But still, aren't they sweet? So, as I was saying, this is how you level up in the game, um, and the, the gameplay here is going to end briefly, um, but you have to kill beasts, consume their blood echoes, and raise your stats. Um, so again, this focus on using the blood of things that you kill to make yourself more powerful, which seems to be different than keeping the blood pure. As we, we learned in, in Lovecraft's writing, he was all about. In fact, his major preoccupation was the intermixing of bloods. Um, think of the shadow over Innsmouth. Um, think of uh, Dagon as well. That, that, that this sort of inbreeding or these fish humanoid people are absolutely terrifying and should not exist. So I'm just really quickly uh, going to run through the the geography of the hunter's dream here to give you a sense of its aesthetics. This is going to be it for the playthrough. Um, really I just wanted you to get a sense of how the game operated, what it looked like, and how it privileges certain narratives over others. So I hope you found this interesting, um, and I hope it helps you kind of tease out Lovecraftian references. If you are still like Jones in for Mud more Bloodborne, um, Take a look at the link within, I believe it was our second week of class, um, and revisit uh, Vati's videos. Um, he does really great at explaining more of the lore of, of Blood, Bloodborne than I could ever do in just 42 minutes of gameplay. So thank you very much for listening, and hope you enjoyed.